Verses we chant two before the end, they're actually listed here also. So, uh, but the other ones just begin on page one. Om Stapitam yena bhutave Swayam rupa kagamayam Dadati swapadantikam Vandeyam shri guru shri uta parakamalam Shri guru vaishnavamsha Shri rupam sagajatam Sahaganaragunatam vitam tam sajivam Sadvaitam Savadutam Parijana Saitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padam Sagana Lalita Shri Vishakam Vitamsha E Krishna Karna Sindhu Dina Bando Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namusute Tapta Kanchana Dorangi Radhe Rinda Veneshuri Vishapanu Sute Devi Pranamami Hare Priye Vachaka Patru Vyascha Kripa Sindhu Vevacha Patitana Pavanebhyo Vaishnavebhyo Namo Namo Vishnu Paraya, Krishna Prashtaya Bhutale, Srimate Bhakti Vedanta, Swami Nityanamine, Namaste Saraswate Devi, Gaudamani Pracharine, Virshesha Shunyavari, Pascharya Deshatarine, Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya, Prabhu Nityananda, Shri Advaita Gadadara, Shri Vasavi Gaurapattavinda, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. 
Welcome. Thank you for adjusting your schedules to accommodate my schedule. I appreciate it. We're meeting on Wednesday. It's the middle of the week, so it's our catalyst to get through the last couple days. So, we'll do a recap as we always do. So what did we discuss last week? Soul, super soul, nature. Sober person. Sober person. Yeah, we'll review what a sober person is in the next one. And what should lead one to be sober? What fact? The fact that body is perishable. The body is perishable. And what is not perishable? The soul. The soul. The soul. And what is this picture trying to remind us of? Change is permanent. Hmm? Change is permanent. Change is permanent. <laughs> One common thing in all the bodies, soul. The soul is the constant that exists through all, right? So the verse said that one who knows that the soul is constantly changing bodies from boyhood to youth to old age, then similarly, when the soul passes into a new body, one's that bewildered. Because that is the constant migration of the soul. It is natural. It has already happened to us many times. We've already exchanged our bodies. Even science says every seven years, the whole body is transformed. Every cell is regenerated. That's the longest living cell is for seven years. So, this sober person understands that the soul is constantly moving. And so what conclusion does the sober person draw from this? What makes them sober? They are unaffected by that change. They're unaffected by that change. Is the change happening to them? Yes. Yes, it is. Trust me. Becoming Krishna conscious isn't going to stop old age in the body, it's going to happen. But it can ultimately stop old age. Because where does this transmigration in the body not occur? Spiritual world. In the spiritual world. Because this body is, what is it made up of? Earth, Earth water, 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 air. Fire, fire, and ether. These are five elements we see all around us. And so, this body, when my soul, when I leave this body, this body will return back to earth. Where it came from. Right? There's the law, the law of conservation of energy also applies. Nothing is gained or lost. It's just transformed. So, how to have a peaceful mind amidst all of this chaos, this sober person? What is required? He said there are three things we have to know. Nature. 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 Super soul. Super soul and? Super. And soul. Very good. Right, if we know the nature of the soul, Arjuna was fearing the battle because he saw the person to be the body, right? We saw, he saw the person to be the body. So when he saw that he was going to destroy the body, he also concluded he was going to destroy the person. But that, in fact, is not the case, right? The soul is eternal. It is imperishable, as we'll see in this verse that we'll discuss this week. So, a sober person, meaning one who is not moved by the ups and downs, knows the constitution. What is knowing the constitution? Is there like a declaration? Of <laughs> what does the constitution mean? What is made of? 
what it's made up of, and what its, its position or purpose is, right? So we have to figure out what is the purpose of my soul? Where does it belong? We'll talk a little bit about that today. And we have to know that the super soul, right? Because just knowing I am not this body, I'm a spirit soul, is that sufficient? I need to then know, well, what is the activity of the soul in relation to everyone else around me, including the Supreme Lord? Is there a relationship? Are we all independent living entities? Are we dependent living in? What is the relationship? And nature, both material and spiritual. Why is it important to know about the spiritual world? That's the final destination. That's the final destination. Okay. But why should I know about the spiritual world? Why? It is a perverted reflection of the material. Okay, so that's a fact. It is a perverted reflection. Like in the lake, you see a reflection of the shoreline, the trees. It's a reflection. But what is the importance of knowing about the spiritual world? So that we can connect our soul to the one, the main soul, which is God. So we can connect our soul to the main. But why will we connect our soul to the super soul ultimately? Because uh, yeah. there is no duality in this. It is eternal. Mm -hmm. And there is no duality. What does duality mean? Uh, cold or cold. Hot or cold, good or bad rich or poor, tall or short, smart or less smart, right? This, everything we see in this world is all relative. So, if we know about the spiritual world, then we can inquire, well, is that a place I would like to go? Is that something that would be beneficial? Is it better than Troy, Michigan? If it is, then I'll begin to act in a way that will lead me to that destination. So, understanding the spiritual world and the material world, because one may say, yeah, well, this constant happiness and stress, that's a fact of life. Just deal with it. Right? Well, that's a fact of life in the material world. Is it a fact of life in the spiritual world? Is there a duality in the spiritual world? No. There is no old age, there is no disease, there is no, nothing but happiness. So we have to know all three. So, in that next verse, what did Krishna say in the 14th verse? He gives a very imp important implication about knowing I am soul and I am not this body. Taking it back to that analogy we started at the very beginning. I am the driver, I am not the car. Right? So what one, what does one do when they have this knowledge? What is this tree doing? Different seasons. Different seasons. So what, what, what example did Krishna give in the 14th verse about the seasons? The change is inevitable, like seasons is going to happen, but a wise man does not get bothered by that. And specifically, he spoke about what type of change? Happiness and distress. Happiness and distress. Mm -hmm. They're going to come and go. Like the coming and going of the seasons. So, now where is this happiness and distress coming to in what Krishna is speaking here? To the body. Is it coming to me? No. It's coming to the body. Like to the car versus the driver. Right? So, Krishna is saying, when one has knowledge of the soul, that I am spirit soul, the happiness and distresses of the body no longer affect our consciousness. But if we are only think and absorb that I am this body, then my happiness goes up and down based on the happiness and distresses of the body. Anybody has experienced the happiness and distresses of the body? <laughs> Every day, right? It's difficult to separate. But we've 
clearly separated when the car is sitting outside in the sun and it is getting very hot. Does that make us uncomfortable? Yes. I mean, no. no, when we're not in the car. No, we're not in the car. Okay. When it's sitting outside, because oh, we are separate from that car. We don't feel it. Now, if we're so obsessed with the car, we may wonder, oh, the poor car, it's getting hot, this, <laughs> right? But there's a separation of experience. So similarly, the soul is residing within this body. Krishna says someone who is wise doesn't allow the ups and downs to happen. So where does, what is the source of our happiness and distress in this body? How do we get happiness and how do we get distress? Material world. In the material world. And it's based on what? Perception. Our past karma. Which means our past activities. Whatever we've done in the past is now creating reactions, either good or bad. So, when one begins to come to see the nature of the soul, they can elevate their consciousness. Take it from the bodily platform. We say transcend. Meaning bring our consciousness to a higher platform. Whether I'm getting happiness or distress in my body, does that affect my relationship with the Supreme Lord? Does that affect my connection with the Supreme Personality of Godhead and devotional service? Is there any implication? No. Just like if the car you're driving in is hit by a stone, it has no tangible effect on the driver. But if we are attached to that car, then we'll feel the effect. So again, Krishna is saying, when one understands the nature of the soul, they begin to transcend. Does it mean once you become self-realized, there won't be happiness and distress of the body? Oh, it's going to come. It's going to come. But our ability to deal with it and not let it shake our consciousness becomes much stronger. How many of us would like to be strong in the midst of of this chaos or these difficulties that we face. Okay. So much of our struggles come in answering why. We don't want to answer the why when the good happens. When the good happens, it's because I'm good, I came. I made it. But when the bad happens, we have so many questions. Why? How could this happen? Why this person did that to me? Why this? So many... And the, Incomplete answer to that leads to so much distress. But we know, anything that happens to us, it is based on our karma. So that's what she was saying. So let's talk about sense enjoyment a little bit. Because this is an important concept. Because when we talk about happiness and distress, and we're saying to transcend to that, I want to be, make a very clear point here. It is not that if we transcend to this higher level of consciousness, we're going to become unemotional. That we're going to become stone-like. I'm going to be very steady regardless of it. Meaning I become very dry in my emotions. That is not what we're speaking of. What we're speaking of is the ups and downs of the body will not affect me. But the pleasures of devotional service is where I will devote my energies. Because bhakti is an active principle, it's an active endeavor, which yields extraordinary happiness and enjoyment. So Krishna will often say, you tolerate the happiness and distress, you ignore them. He is not trying to make us emotionless. He is trying to make us emotionless to the body, and full of emotion with the soul. It's a very important distinction that we want to make. So there are two types of sense enjoyment. You can probably guess what they are. What's the first type that we are most familiar with? Material. Material or to the body. Right? And what is the second type? Spiritual. Maybe we don't know about this. Is there spiritual sense enjoyment? Right? 
So we'll get to discuss that a little bit. So what is the nature or the characteristics of sense enjoyment on the body or material platform? It has two main characteristics. Active. It's active. Both are active. Right? Temporary. 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 And? That's the result. <laughs> Uh, ups and downs. Temporary means ups and downs, okay. right? You'll have it, you'll lose it, you'll have it, you'll lose it. Okay. And? We can quantify. You can quantify. quantify. Means it's limited. limited. It's limited. Right? You can put a number on it. So, that is temporary and limited. Okay? So, what are some examples of activities that are related to this material sense enjoyment? Vacation. <laughs> we go and just relax on the beach, right? That is temporary material sense enjoyment. Good example. Any ice cream? Ice cream. Yes. Ice cream. You scream. We all scream for ice cream. Whee! That is material sense enjoyment. What else? Money. Money. What is green paper gonna do? <laughs> it's a, so money is not happiness, it's a so-called means to happiness. You can buy more ice cream, you can go on more vacations, right? What are some other examples? The ability to drive a racing car for five minutes. To drive a beautiful, fast, fancy race car. <laughs> That's sense enjoyment, right? What else? Movies. 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 We live in someone else's fantasy world for some couple hours. We lose ourselves in that existence, right? Yes, yes. enjoyment. Yeah. Any other? Outside, yeah. Yeah. Eating all kinds of foodstuffs, right? Not just ice cream. All kinds of varieties of foodstuffs. That's pleasurable to the body, right? Any other examples? With Relationships, that's a nice one. Yeah, relationships with the body. Different relationships are a part of sense enjoyment. Intoxication. Intoxication. That is a form of sense enjoyment. Trying to lose ourselves from our current situation. How long could we go on? <laughs> Forever. <laughs> that is the important. We have invented unlimited varieties of sense enjoyment. How many movies are there? Why every year we need to have more movies? Why aren't last year's movies still good enough? Because if we've seen them, we think we need something new. And why do we think we need something new? Because, because we're, we're not bored of it. By... We're bored of it. Why? It's limited. The amount of pleasure it can give is limited. So we need a new version. How many new restaurants are appearing every day? Why? There are not enough foodstuffs to eat? How many restaurants the cow goes to eat? It eats one kind of grass. No masala, no different type. How many types of rice we eat? <laughs> because it's limited. Right? When we go on a vacation, a beautiful vacation, what is our fear from almost the time we reach there? It'll end. It'll end. That pit is it? Oh, yeah. four days left, three days left, two days left. While on vacation, trying to enjoy, because it's temporary, it can't give that full satisfaction. Even the most perfect vacation, because we know it will end. Imagine what life would be like if we were experiencing some fun activity and we had no fear of it ending. That's what exists in spiritual sense enjoyment. So what is the nature of spiritual enjoyment? Permanent, Permanent and 
What does unlimited mean? No. Give me like a tangible example. Huh? It'll never run out. Like sun. No It'll way. never run out. Sunlight. The sunlight. That is a material example of almost unlimited, right? It's like constantly emanating. So the one question I have, or the one tangible experience we have of unlimited happiness in spiritual life. How many of you are chanting at least daily or some amount? Most of you are chanting, right? Mm -hmm. Now think about this. You are chanting three words. Hare, Krishna, and Rama. You're chanting it over 108 beats every day. But it never wears, you never get to the bottom of it in terms of the sweetness of it. Maybe there's, there's not so much sweetness yet, but as we progress, you'll find more and more happiness from it. How is that possible? Because it is a spiritual activity. It is unlimited. Can you watch the same movie every day for the rest of your life? No. You cannot. Because everything material has this temporary nature and this limited feature of the happiness it can give. So in both material and spiritual sense enjoyment pursuits, what is the end goal? Happiness. Happiness. That is the end goal. Shall I ask the, my favorite question? Does anyone not want to be happy? <laughs> Anybody woke up today wanting to be unhappy? <laughs> no. We wake up every day searching for happiness. And on the body material platform, we go through so many varieties, attempts. Think about how much endeavor, effort, we have to do just to give this tongue happiness to fuel the body. Imagine if your car required so much variety of fuel, how frustrated we would be. <laughs> Imagine every day, new variety of fuel. And, oh, I don't like this. I'm not eating leftover. This is all I need. For. Imagine how frustrating that would be. So just a simple process of fueling this body, we go through so much endeavor to try to yield. And how much happiness you get from a nice meal few moments mm -hmm. and then all the side effects cholesterol <laughs> diabetes <laughs> calorie count this that and all the things yeah. you go on a wonderful vacation still side effects dent in the wallet sunburn, sunburn. <laughs> <laughs> Work, more work when you come home because you've been gone for a week. Jet all these things. Jet lag. <laughs> right? There are side effects from all of this stuff. So we have experienced it. So the pursuit of eating nice things, seeing nice things, hearing nice things, is that, a, is that the wrong thing we should be pursuing? Some yeses and some noes. What does Krishna want us to do? Does he not want us to hear and eat nice things and see nice things? Yeah. We, have to. we have to. We have to because why? What you see, that's what you think I mean. We gotta keep the body alive. We have to keep the body alive, so we'll talk about that. But what about the general nature of my pursuit for this happiness? Do I have what is the nature of the soul? To be, active. to be active and to enjoy. One of the principal ingredients of the soul is ananda, happiness. So the nature to be searching for happiness is a good thing. That's what we all want. We should not be shy about that. We should not think, oh no, looking and trying to be happy is selfish or has some immoral. No, that is what we want. But do we want this type or that type? We want temporary or eternal? Eternal. Limited or unlimited? unlimited? Well, if that's what we want, where do we have to look? To the soul. The body, is it temporary or eternal? Temporary. Is the soul temporary or eternal? Eternal. 
So if I want eternal happiness, I have to go to an eternal realm, to an eternal level. That is the soul. So we have experienced the ups and downs, the happiness and distresses of material sense enjoyment. But 100% of the time, if we truly objectively analyze, it ultimately results in frustration. Either because whatever was great, it ended, or whatever was great had some later side effects, or some other repercussions, or whatever it is. But whatever we have experienced, 100%, not most of the time, not some of the time, 100% of the time. But we don't want to acknowledge that. So we just, okay, you're depressing me, stop now. Well, it would be depressing if there were not a, an alternative. And so what Krishna is going to be speaking to us, because this soul topic is very technical, but he's going to bring this just to understand where to find the best enjoyment and happiness. And that is going to be from spiritual sense enjoyment. So we talk about all kinds of varieties of material sense enjoyment. What are some varieties of spiritual sense enjoyment? Service. Service sounds like work. But it's not. Anyone care to share their own experience in service that was maybe surprising? <laughs> the kind of uh, satisfaction that you get when you go and do, uh, even service is even offering the food to God and uh, then ha having it. Mm. The, um, that satisfaction that you receive is, uh, and the feeling that you get is uh, unsurpassable. And that, even though it may be an extra effort, but you would like to take go the extra mile to do that, <laughs> though you may be even tired. But still, you would do that, and then you can feel the difference. And if you've not done, you feel kind of guilty too. So. And if you couldn't feel the difference, you wouldn't do it. Why would we do it? Right? If there wasn't a reciprocation. And what is that difference? That is the Lord embracing us, saying thank you. It is an active relationship with Krishna, who is embracing us in that service. You want to talk to something? I just think like I don't have an example as far as like probably spiritual service but yeah. like I'm in healthcare sure. and I deal with 190 patients every day who are challenged in Detroit and like I always have to go the extra mile and do more and do more and do more and do more yeah. when they don't sometimes even care for themselves and it's a lot of work for me but at the end of the day like I see their lives changed yeah. and so I don't get paid for that part, but I still do it. It's a service to my community because... And it's very fulfilling. It's fulfilling because I see their lives change. So I'm, I equate spiritual service to the same, I guess. Like, yeah, it's, it's on a, it's on a elevated platform. Yeah. When we begin to serve the Lord, it's an unquantifiable experience. We can't quite pinpoint it. Why? How do you quantify limited or unlimited? You can't. You can't quite describe it. But it's tangible. It's there. Right? So, these activities of service, of honoring Krishna Prashadam. You honor his foods, and you're wondering, like, man, this is incredible. Something's there. But you can't quite pinpoint it. What's there is the love it went into offering it to the Lord. Now, how do you put an ingredient on that? But it's there. Go and see the beautiful forms of the Lord. Hear about the wonderful pastimes of the Lord. You can hear the same pastimes of Krishna and His great associates over and over again. They never tire. But each time we hear, they actually get sweeter. Each time you see a movie, does it get better? Maybe the first, second, third. But at some point, it just... You start to tune out even. Your mind, but in spiritual experiences, it's the opposite. Right? So, the point that Krishna is going to bring us to is to begin to experience that spiritual sense enjoyment. So don't think that when the Lord says you should tolerate happiness and distress, 
our goal is to become some kind of mystic. We're just going to be completely mute, silent, immovable, and stone-like. That is not what the Lord is saying. The Lord is saying, you jump, you enjoy, you feast, you dance, you sing. But sing with the soul, feast with the soul, enjoy with the soul. Because you are spirit soul. That's where you're going to find this real happiness. So in the 15th verse, Krishna says, O best among men, the person who is not disturbed by happiness and distress is steady in both, is certainly eligible for liberation. So one who is not disturbed by happiness and distress of the body, what does that allow them to do? Liberation. And why liberation? No longer attached. No longer attached to the bodily pleasures. Nor are the bodily pleasures, the ups and downs, distracting them from their spiritual quest. You know, it's just like if you are in a, um, a, I don't know, a coffee shop and you are trying to study. There's all kinds of activities going on around you. But if you're really focused on your study... All those activities don't disturb you. But because they don't disturb you, does it mean they're not going on? No, they're taking place. So like that, in a very crude example, the spiritualist, yeah, the ups and downs of the body are happening. But one's focus and determination in their spiritual life remains steady. So the Lord is saying, when one becomes steady through all the background noise, the bodily ups and downs is background noise. What's important is our undeviated relationship with the Lord. So I'll chant only if I get the promotion, only if I'm feeling good, the weather is nice, you know, my pocketbook is full. These conditions we put, well, that's because we still have attachment. But one who is eligible to transcend to the spiritual world is steady. The key in success of anything, material or spiritual, is steadiness, consistency. Right? But it's difficult to be consistent. So the Lord is saying, let the ups and downs of the body go. They're going to happen. Don't let it shake your determination. He's going to speak a lot about that towards the end of this chapter. Okay? So now let's discuss the 17th verse. This is a short discussion verse, so don't think, oh my God, we're just starting the verse. How long are we going to be here tonight? <laughs> don't worry. This is a short discussion verse. I thought I'd introduce a, a new topic of this sense enjoyment because this topic is going to carry through now for the rest of this chapter. Okay. So someone wants to read the 17th verse? Avinasitu tadvidi yena sarvam idam tatam vinasam avyayasyasyas nakas chetkarto marhati That which pervades the entire body you should know to be indestructible. No one is able to destroy that imperishable soul. Okay, someone can read the purport, first paragraph. This verse more clearly explains the real nature of the soul, which is spread all over the body. Anyone can understand what is spread all over the body. It is consciousness. Everyone is conscious of the pains and pleasures of the body in part or as a whole. This Spreading of consciousness is limited within one's own body. The pains and pleasures of one body are unknown to another. Therefore, each and every body is the embodiment <coughs> of an individual soul, and the symptom of the soul's presence is perceived as individual consciousness. This soul is described as one ten thousandth part of the upper portion of the hair point in size. Yes. So you can just read the translation in the verse. When the upper point of a hair is divided into 100 parts, and again each of such parts is further divided into 100 parts, each such part is a measurement of the dimension of the spirit soul. Similarly, the same version is stated. There are innumerable particles of spiritual atoms 
which are measured as one ten thousandth of the upper portion of the hair. Therefore, the individual particle. Wait, 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 you will stop there in the discussion. So, that which pervades the entire body, you should know to be indestructible. No one is able to destroy that imperishable soul. So remember, Arjuna is facing the situation of having to shoot arrows. So Krishna is reminding Arjuna that the soul is imperishable. It means... Will the arrows be able to pierce the soul? No. So, the first part of the purport, Prabhupada explains, how do we know the presence of the soul? How can we know if the soul is present or not? By what? Consciousness. By consciousness. And what does consciousness mean? Feeling. Feeling. Does this bottle have a soul? No. If I tap on it, is there consciousness to perceive that tapping? No. But if someone taps on your leg, are you able to feel that? It means there's consciousness. Right? So one of the proofs of the presence of the soul is that there is consciousness. So what happens when someone passes away? What is passed away? Unconscious. No consciousness, no soul. So the soul has passed. The body is lying there. Intact. But something is left. Because we know now there is no consciousness. If you pinch the toe, is there a response? No. But when the soul was present and you pinch the toe, is there a response? Yes. So consciousness is the proof of the presence of the soul. Right? And this consciousness is spread throughout where? The whole body. The whole body. Just my body? Every living body. All living. But if I stub my toe, do you say ouch? No. Why not? Because your soul is your own. Because your my soul is my own, your soul is your own. How many of those are there? Innumerable. So I don't have the same soul as the ant and the tree and so we have the same. Now, is, is the nature of the soul, the type of soul in the tree different than the soul that I have or you have? No. no. But they're a tree. Consciousness is different. Huh? Consciousness is different. Consciousness. But the soul is? Part and parcel of? Krishna. Krishna. Right? So does a tiny little ant have a soul? Yes. And a giant elephant? And everything in between? Yes. There are souls. Because there is consciousness. That is the... Prabhupada speaks about, in this next paragraph, about one question. Science is always speaking about how the body is powered. What's the power source of the body? And they break it down to the red blood cells and these corpsicles that carry. But they still haven't figured out what is the ultimate power source for that heart and that body? But what is that ultimate power source? Soul. soul. And how powerful that soul is, right? So, you know, where does the soul reside? In the heart. In the heart. And how do we know? Because? Why are you being shy? Because Krishna says. Yeah, don't be shy. Because Krishna said so. I don't care what CNN says or CNBC says or some other biologist says. Why? Because what they say tomorrow or today will change tomorrow. 
What Krishna said 5,000 years ago, will it change 5 million years from now? Because it's the absolute truth. So Krishna says, through the scriptures, the soul resides in the heart. So where does the soul reside? In the heart. In the heart. Right? So it has a home. But how big is the soul? Tiny. Tiny. One ten thousandth the tip of a hair. This guy has funny hair. He and I are similar, right? <laughs> So if you take a hair tip and you cut it into a hundred pieces, and then you take one of those pieces and you cut that into, that is the size of the soul. Yet it's so powerful that it can fuel this body for 50, 70, 100 years. When, this when the soul leaves, how much effort it's take to carry this body. It takes three, four people to carry this body from one place to the next. With great effort. So how powerful is the soul? It's extraordinarily powerful. Why? Because it's part and parcel of? Krishna. So the nature of the soul is this way. And if we see in the coming verses, Krishna is going to begin to um, discuss this in the 21st verse. He says, How can a person who knows that the soul is indestructible, eternal, unborn, and immutable kill anyone or cause anyone to kill? Meaning, if there is a battle, who is being killed? The body. The body, not the soul. And then Krishna says in the 22nd verse, As a person puts on new garments, Giving up old ones, the soul similarly accepts new bodies, giving up the old and useless ones. It says in the 23rd verse, The soul can never be cut to pieces by any weapons, nor burned by fire, nor moistened by water, nor withered by the wind. So why can no fire or no water, or no wind ever destroy the soul. You mean a power giant nuclear bomb can't destroy this little old soul? Why? Because it's eternal. And what is the nature of the soul? What is it made up of? which are spiritual properties. What is a giant nuclear bomb? <laughs> what is superior? Matter cannot touch spirit. I don't care how, no matter how sharp the weapon is, no matter how hot the fire is, it cannot touch spirit. Because spirit is of a superior energy. Krishna is going to explain in the seventh chapter this parana para shakti. Everything is either is superior energy or is, or is inferior energy. Our soul is made up of a superior spiritual energy. Our body is made up of what kind of his material energy, which is destructible. Okay. So this soul is fully indestructible. And Krishna says that one should not grieve then for the body. Hmm? One who has taken his birth is sure to die. Never like to talk about that. But it's a fact. We celebrate birthdays. But as soon as one is born, we know at some point, that day is coming. Right? And Krishna says, after death, one is sure to take birth again. Why? Because doing material activities means I'm creating karma, new reactions. 
As long as I have some credits, good or bad, in my account, at the end of this life, it means I have to come back and receive those credits. But while I'm in that next life, receiving those credits, what am I doing? Creating more. Creating more good karma and bad karma. So I get to the end of that life, and again I have some balance, which means I have to come back again. And in that life I receive those credits, but at the same time I am putting new ones. And when does this end? Until one comes to understand, I am a spirit soul. No more bodily activities. Let us come to the spiritual part. So, this is the nature of the soul. Prabhupada made a comment in the 16th purport I wanted to read. He says, removal of ignorance involves, removal of ignorance involves the re-establishment of the eternal relationship between the worshiper and the worshipable. Both. And Krishna Prabhupada uses the word re-establishment. It's a very important term. Because our relationship with the Supreme Lord, that is an eternal relationship. It exists eternally. But we have temporarily forgotten it. So the process of Krishna consciousness is to reestablish, to reawaken this relationship that is already there. It is not a new relationship we are trying to form. It has been there eternally. And it will always be there in the future. So the question for us is when we want to revive that. And how do we revive that relationship? It is through our spiritual Krishna consciousness. And it starts with understanding, I am spirit soul, I am not this body. And that is why Krishna has spoken almost 20 verses. The first topic he speaks about is the soul. So next week we're going to now move on to some other topics. Almost every session we will discuss, we are not this body, we are a spirit soul. Because that is the essence of everything, the foundation from which everything else is built upon and not so easy for us to live day to day. But in time it will become very easy, very natural. Just as it's very natural for you to know I am not the car, I am the driver, as natural as that is to you, in time this consciousness of I am spirit soul, I am not this body will be just as natural. And you'll think back, think, how foolish it was for me to think I'm the car. You'll think, how foolish it was when I thought I was the body. But a little bit hard to imagine from our perspective today. But by the practice of devotional service, it will happen very quickly. So any comments or discussion? Okay. So when someone wants how he or she gets the soul? It comes by nature or how it feels? How he or she, yeah. So the question is, when someone is born, how does that soul enter that body? So, at the end of this life, we will have various desires in our mind. And those desires in the mind will then carry the soul, the mind, the intelligence and false ego, those four things, to the next body. Now, how, how do we know where to go? How does the soul know where to go? What's based on which body it will go into? Right? So it's based on two things. One, what is your desire? So Krishna says in the 8th chapter, Yam yam vapis maram bhavam tyajantate kalevaram. He says, whatever you desire, at the end of this life, that you will achieve. So our desire is the first part. And the second part is our qualification. Meaning, 
I may desire, I use this example all the time, to live in a mansion. So I may live in a mansion, but whether I'm the owner or the cockroach in that mansion mm -hmm. depends on my karma. So my karma will determine which body I will take. Will I take a very advanced body like the human form? Or maybe a lower life form? Like a tree or a bird or a piece of grass, some different avenue. So desires and karma will dictate. And who carries that? The modes of nature. So material nature will transport the soul, mind, intelligence, false ego into the next body. And that's how it, uh, it, the, the constant transmigration. So our goal by the end of this time, whenever that is, is to have one desire. And that is to be in eternal loving service of Krishna. Now every day we wake up, we have two choices. Either I'm going to serve my body, or I'm going to serve Krishna. Do I really have any other choices? When you really simplify it down, you have two choices. So, by knowledge and experience, we'll begin to make that desire, that my desire is to serve Krishna. And if that desire begins today, and it remains with us undisturbed, undeviated, then yes, whenever that moment comes, when this body is done and is ready to go to the next point, that desire in the mind will say, I want to be back with Krishna, then that's where we'll go. Because in the 8th chapter, Krishna says, Antakale chamameva smala muktva kalevaram ya prayati samadbhavam yati nastake samshaya. He says, at, if one at the end of this life thinks of me while quitting this body, they will achieve and reach my eternal abode. Of this, there is no doubt. Simply by remembering the Lord at the time of leaving this body. But if we've spent our whole life remembering movies and cricket matches and vacations and foodstuffs and this and that and all, and we haven't spent much time thinking of the Lord, what are we going to think of? What we spent our whole life thinking of. Okay. I have two questions. Um, so, what does it signify that the people there? You said one ten thousand, one by ten thousand of uh, the people there. Why it is so small? Why it is so small? Well, it is. That is the size given in the scriptures. <laughs> what happens is the spiritual body we had as it comes into contact with the material world, compresses very, very tightly because it's covered with the false ego. And it shrinks down to this size. Why exactly this size? That's what Krishna chose. Uh, yeah, the second question is, uh, how does it uh, so what are the karma we have? So uh, when, we are enter when we are in the devotional service, uh, are we going to minimize the karma or we have to go through the karma in this life so that we mm. we go to the next life with a better <laughs> elevated uh, because of the devotion? Or well, the so the question is, based on my past karma, if I'm beginning to do devotional life, do I have to consume all my past karma first before I can then kind of really make progress forward? So maybe I have to wait one lifetime to get them. Well, if that were the case, we'd be in deep trouble. <laughs> Why? Why next lifetime? You think next by you think in this lifetime you can undo all the karma? You've had millions of births. Millions of births. How much karma you would have accumulated? How much karma we would have accumulated? Virtually unlimited. It's not unlimited. But the list is so long. It would take us millions of births to consume that karma. Think, Dhritarashtra, in one action, it took him a hundred births 
to receive the fruits of that one action. When he killed a hundred birds. When he was the son of a hunter. So, to consume all of our past karma, it would take millions of lifetimes. So now what? Are we stuck? And that's why Krishna says, Sarva dharmam pritya jama mekam sharnam braja aham tam sarva pape bhyo moksha ishram ma sucha. He says, surrender unto me. Give up everything else. Why give up everything else? Because surrendering to Krishna, he will... Nullify all of our past reactions. Aham tam sarva pap, pape bio, all your sin. Gone. When? When one surrenders unto him. Whatever we've done in the past, Krishna is saying, I am willing to forget all of it. And he says, Ma suchaha, do not fear. So, in just this short lifetime, we can undo all the sins, not only of this life, who, this life is a very small, it's one page in a giant book. Okay, maybe we're a third of the way through the page, half away through the page, or three quarters of the way through the page in terms of our lifespan. Does it really matter in the context of the whole book? No. So, Krishna is saying, by devotional service, it is so powerful, so potent. He says, nobody is unqualified to do bhakti in the ninth chapter. He'll say, you can be the most fallen of fallen persons. And you can immediately take to devotional service and very quickly undo all of that. So Prabhupada said, you finish your business in this lifetime. Why you are willing to risk next lifetime? If you have a potent medicine to cure your disease today, will you wait till tomorrow to take the medicine? No, you'll take it now. We have a very potent medicine, this devotional service. Bhakti is so powerful that the most fallen, unqualified, degraded persons can quickly take to devotional service. And we see it time and time again. That's how powerful it is. Even if one makes a mistake in devotional service, what they do is never lost. And Krishna says, my devotee never perishes. That he also says in night. So bhakti is very, very powerful, very potent. And it can undo whatever we've done in the past. The key is, now don't add more. Yes? So by doing pious activities alone, we will not be able to minimize our karma, right? Only through bhakti we will be able to minimize our karma. What does pious activities do? Good karma. Good karma. What is good karma going to get us? Next. A body. Pious activities, is it good for the body or good for the soul? Body. Bhakti, is it good for the body or good for the soul? soul? Both. But first the soul. So pious activities, better than impious, of course. Better to do pious than impious. But pious activities are just going to get us a healthier body. It's going to get us the A-class jail cell. Yeah, so we've given up the B-class or C-class cells, but I'm still in jail. I'm still in birth, death, old age disease. Still limited. Still temporary. One must come to the platform of the soul to get eternal benefits. And that is bhakti. So just pious credits alone, because remember, good does not cancel bad. I acted like a rascal last night, doing all kinds of crazy things. Today I'll go do some charity work to offset. No. Those activities you did the day before, you have to take those fruits. And whatever fruits you did today of good stuff, you also take those fruits. You have to eat both. Sorry. Good doesn't cancel out bad. And most importantly, most importantly, 
one of the major offenses we can make in devotional service. There are very few. But one of the major offenses we can take in devotional service is to think that by doing bhakti, I can intentionally do sinful activities. Oh, I can do sinful activities because it's so powerful. Krishna says, Mansu Chaha. No. Unfortunately, now you all have knowledge. <laughs> Fortunately, you do. I said that in joking. You cannot depend to undo future sins knowingly done. The fifth offense, excuse me, the seventh offense, is to commit sinful activities on the strength of chanting the holy names of Lord. Oh, I want to be a rascal tonight and do some crazy things? I'll chant a few extra rounds in the morning. <laughs> Extraordinarily dangerous. Why? Because then you will never recover from those sins, and that offense is also extraordinarily detrimental. So do not make that mistake and think, I can rely on that. Any other comments or questions? Yes. Uh, my father had a question for us. Uh, what is, uh, he is looking surprised. <laughs> <laughs> Last week and this week, we are trying to get the knowledge of soul. But uh, it is not in my experience or his experience at this moment. Yeah. How to get how to get the realization on spirit soul? What is the yeah. sadhana yeah. How to get into that state? Because only knowing is not making me, if you are saying like, is not helping me. How to get the realization? What will help him? Yeah. So that experiencing the soul and the experience that I am spirit soul and I'm not this body is very difficult um, because it's very subtle, right? Anything tangible, I can experience my hand because it's a tangible. So I have very good knowledge of my hand because it's a, now the soul, I cannot see it. It's, it's subtle. But you are experiencing the soul every time you're experiencing some happiness in spiritual life. That is the experience of the soul. So when you go to the temple and you're somehow just feeling blissful, relieved, happy, that is the tangible experience of the soul. That's not the experience of the body. Don't think, oh, I ate this prasadam and I am enjoying it, that my belly and tongue are enjoying it. No, that is the experience of the soul. So what we have to know is by the experiences, which are of the soul and which are the platform. I'm sorry, of the body. When we go and we hear some wonderful bhajans that are just in rapture, and we think, oh, the mind is calm. Yeah, the mind is calming. But it is the soul that is experiencing that great bliss and happiness. So as we experience them, we'll begin to realize and then begin more and more to identify, oh, that is me that is experiencing that. When I say my soul, I really should say I soul. Right? Because I am the soul. Um, but don't be um, demotivated that if you're not experiencing the soul in the body. It's very difficult. It takes, just remember, for millions and millions and millions and millions of lifetimes, we have been condition, ingrained in our mind to think, I am body. So now after just 6, 8, 10 weeks, 12 weeks, 2, 3 years even, it's not going to happen overnight that this consciousness of I am soul. But just as I know now I am not the car, I am the person, that same experience will happen with this and the way to do it is by more chanting, more reading, more association, and more prasadam. A, B, C, Ds. Just by doing more bhakti, this, just like, you know, if a young girl goes to a dance class, and she's going and she's thinking, I'm going to dance like, you know, some wonderful dancer she has seen on some TV. And she goes... And she's just doing this a hundred times over and over again. And then this a hundred times over. I, 
I came here to dance. What is this nonsense? But we know she keeps doing, keeps practicing, keeps following the instructions. Soon she will dance like this very wonderful person she has been admiring her whole life. That experience of dancing will come out. But it takes practice. It takes sincerity. It takes repetition. So similarly, our sadhana. What is sadhana? Our daily chanting, our daily reading, our daily service. That is the practice that will bring about this experience. So how fast it will happen? It depends on all of us. How sincere is our practice? Just like that girl is dancing. How sincere her practice is, is how quickly she'll become a very wonderful dancer. How quickly I will become fully self-realized is based on the sincerity of my practice. The more I practice, the faster it will happen. And there, you should have faith it will happen because it has happened to every single person who has tried this before you. And it will happen to every single person who tries this process after you. And ultimately because Krishna says so. He says it is the only means to realize and perceive the soul is to come to a spiritual consciousness. So it is guaranteed to happen. How fast? That is up to us. The process is powerful. It is up to our application to determine how quickly it happens. It's okay? So which path you would like to do? <laughs> path, definitely. Huh? Why? Right. That so, brings happiness in our living. So the question is, in the Srimad Bhagavatam, in the sixth canto, the very beginning of the sixth canto, there's a pastime of Ajamya. Actually, we'll be discussing his pastime in a few weeks because Prabhupada will quote his story. And so what happened is he had lived his life, he started his life in devotional life, he had lost it. His whole life he was living a rascal type life, doing very, very bad, heinous things. And at the very last moment of his life, he called out to Narayan. But he wasn't calling out to Lord Narayan. He was calling out to his child who he had named Narayan. And so, the Yamudutas were ready to take his soul to the hellish planets to give all the reactions to his sinful activities. But as soon as he called out Narayan, the Vishnu Duttas came and were ready to take the soul back to Lord Vishnu. And there was a discussion of what happened. And, and the Yamadutta said, Don't you know the list of what he has done is miles and miles long? And, and the Vishnu said, No matter, he has called out to Narayan. And the Vishnu Yamadutta said, Yeah, but he's not calling out to your Narayan, he's calling out to this boy Narayan. Doesn't matter. Narayan is Narayan. And so he achieved salvation. Not actually immediately. Actually, he regains his body, goes to, I believe, Rishikesh, and completes his devotion, then goes. So the point there is well, why don't we just wait till the end? I'll name all my children names of God, and I'll be all safe. I'm all good. Right? I'm good. Well, two things. Remember, the process of devotional service in and of itself is giving pleasure and happiness. So, if you have a chance to start now and beginning to experience the bliss and happiness, it's not just our, to punch our ticket to go somewhere else. The, the activity of bhakti in itself is so much pleasurable. Why not start today? Even if my last breath is known to be long, long time from now, I still have to choose every day how I'll find happiness. And Krishna is going to explain, nothing will give you more happiness than experiencing devotional life. 
So whether our time is long away or short, might as well give today what will give me the most happiness. That's the most way. But if you're not so convinced, you think, yeah, I'll, I'd rather take the, you know, latter choice. What is the probability you'll actually experience a Jamil success? I liken it to this. I heard somebody give this example. That it's like saying your child says, I'm not going to go to college. And you say, well, how are you going to pay for your life? I'm just going to buy a lottery ticket. So in theory, that works, right? You cannot argue in theory. But is that a bankable solution? Is that a reliable strategy? No, oh, it's a foolish strategy. Because the probability of it happening is so de minimis. So, you know, the, the probability of having that experience like a Jamil is very low. So why that story was told? What's the point of that story then? It is to show the extraordinary potency of the holy names. That a Jamil in calling out Narayan with the intent of calling his son, not even Lord Narayan, but calling it out in a mood of not wanting anything. We call unmotivated. He was not calling Narayan, give me this, give me that, give me this and that, which we normally do. He was calling out to his, his son Narayan in love. So if, if that in and of itself has the potency to elevate somebody. Imagine what's the potency when each day we pick up our beat bag and we try to chant the holy names of the Lord with the goal and intention of calling out to the Lord. Imagine the potency of that. It's so powerful. But we think because it's a relatively simple process, it must not be that powerful. Because our material minds say no pain, no gain. But to illustrate the power of the holy names, Shukadev Goswami narrates this pastime of Ajamil. And we'll talk in more detail about Ajamil in a few weeks and share this pastime. So, um, but they achieved the same end destination. Okay? But again, it's not the time what matters here. It's the, the whole heartedness what should matter even. Yes. So wholeheartedly, if you do so one day, or without whole heart, if you do ten days, doesn't two matter. different doesn't matter. Yeah. yeah. And you see that, you know, sometimes you'll see, you know, someone maybe in Krishna consciousness for 10, 12, 15 years, and seemingly making some progress, but and someone else comes, and in two months, they're, you know, in a whole different realm. Well, that's. Not based on the, they don't have different beads, or let me go buy their kinds of beads. They must have some uh, magic beads. No, it's what the, how much of the heart they put into their chanting, into their reading, into their association. So not everyone will have the same path forward. It's all up to us. So the more sincerely we chant, and sincere chanting means that we do it every day. Rain or shine. And we do it with the intense desire to please the Lord, to begging Him, please let me realize I am spirit, soul, I am not this body. I am so f dense, I don't see it. I am hearing you, but I don't see it. Please help me experience that. Please rid me of all of my attachments to these nonsense. I know it's going to end poorly. But I'm so fallen and so stupid, I can't give up. Help me. When we chant in this prayerful mood, the Lord hears those prayers. And He comes. And He gives. He says, that Tam Sataiva Bajami Hum, Ma Vira Ye Prabhadyante Tam Sataiva Bajami Hum. To the degree of our surrender, the Lord reciprocates back. So that due to the intensity of our desire in our chanting. So chant every day and chant with desire, but not material desires. Because what is a few dollars in your bank account really going to do for you? Not very much. But what really can do something for you is the realization, I am spirit soul. That can change 
your life eternally. So when we chant, we want to chant with this intensity of desire, with a concentration on the Lord. And whatever you know, things we are not able to accomplish or feel or experience, pray to Krishna to help us. And how do you think He's going to respond? He's going to make it happen. And this is what we call purity of chanting, unmotivated chanting. Chanting for, in anything in devotional service, for some material gains, it's mixed bhakti. It's still better than not doing bhakti. Krishna says in the seventh chapter, they're also pious. Those who come to me for money or in distress, wise or curious. But when we come to the pure platform of devotional service, with no mood, no desire, but to be in loving service with Him, the power is so strong. It's unlimited. So, let us take to our chanting as intensely as we can.